The COVID-19 global pandemic delivered a huge blow to communities across the North American division. Shuttered organizations, rampant unemployment, rapidly escalating food insecurity, food banks were quickly overwhelmed. Adventist Community Services recognized that although businesses and churches were closing their doors, ACS food distribution programs were an essential and personal ministry needed in this crisis more than ever. When COVID hit, Pastor Tommy went around our neighborhood and asked, what are some needs that you have? And people responded with food. What you see here is what God has called us to do. We've been blessed to partner with him in feeding our community, restoring some hope and bringing some joy to Auburn City. NAD ACS provided grants totaling over $2 million for COVID response to all 59 conferences in Canada, the United States, Bermuda, and Guam Micronesia Mission. We are here in the Bronx, New York with Greater New York Conference and Northeastern Conference. We have uh, just worked out a partnership between Adventist Community Services and Second Harvest. And what you see happening behind me is Second Harvest is actually dropping with us a load of food that will be used by our food pantries all over the city of New York. Every Monday until the end of the year, Second Harvest is gonna drop off a trailer load of food to us to use for our food pantries to get out to the people that are in need right now. To maintain the safety of their volunteers and their clients, many ACS food pantries quickly shifted to drive-through service. I've talked to so many people that have come through uh, and almost with tears in their eyes, they just say, thank you. They're just so appreciative for, of what uh, we're able to do. And it, it's about the only thing we can do as a church, right? All of our worship services are online. So it's the one time that our church family could actually come together uh, and Sabbath, because we are providing Sabbath for people in our community. We're allowing them to rest from worrying about getting their food. And I think that's exactly what God would want us to do. Since the start of the pandemic, over 1,300 ACS centers across NAD are serving between two to five times the number of clientele normally served and have provided millions of meals. This is Storehouse's ministry to feed those during the time of the pandemic. So far on a weekly basis, we are actually feeding hundreds of families. And today you see our volunteers here, we're giving out food and clothing today to the people of the North Bronx. Right now, we happen to be one of the largest distribution centers in the North Bronx. And so we're glad to be able to do it to help our people right now. In addition to addressing hunger, ACS volunteers have been making masks, collecting and distributing PPE, offering free COVID testing in partnership with health organizations, providing sanitized mobile shower vans, and much more. We're here every Tuesday in Auburn doing COVID testing. Cars will often line up here as early as 6.30 in the morning. This church has been phenomenal as far as helping us with the community. A whole congregation involved in health programs. And then when the food, 375 families got food one day. Es una manera de dar a conocer a la, a la comunidad que Cristo viene pronto y que deben estar preparados. Y a la vez que somos el medio por el cual las bendiciones están llegando para ellos en este tiempo y siempre. El templo estará cerrado, pero como iglesia estamos abiertos para la comunidad. The only reason why we are a church is that we are to spread the good gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself set the example uh, by working with the community uh, we as a Seventh-day Adventist church can replicate uh, that tremendous work that Jesus did by identifying with the needs of the community. ACS is a family of ministries with a mission to alleviate suffering, bring hope, and serve communities in Christ's name. Your generous contributions to Adventist community services will enable ACS to continue to respond in our communities. Let's give hope together. And a sermon is an investment you can't lose. How to be sure your money is secure. Isn't that really, we want security? 
So let's take a look today and find out about this. Jesus talked a great deal about money. Out of his 38 parables, how many do you think mentioned possessions and money? 16 out of 38. So he wanted us to learn how to handle our money possessions. There's 500 verses in the Bible on prayer. About 500 on faith. How many do you think, this is a rhetorical question, I guess, on possessions and money? 2,000 verses in the Bible on possessions and money. Money must be an important subject to God. He wants us to trust him to provide for our needs. Many people spend a lot of time worrying about money, how to pay bills. And they worry about the things that they need. They worry about their future. They worry about will they have enough money when they retire. People are seeking something that's stable, something they can rely on, something that's permanent. But where can we find security for their, our present and future? That's what people are looking for. God never intended that you and I would have to worry about these things. He talks about fear not many times in the Bible. Don't worry. He asks us to trust in him. Amen? Right? Trusting in him. Jesus said, therefore, do not worry. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So a heavenly Father knows what we need. This all started back in the Garden of Eden. How much Adam and Eve must have enjoyed that perfect world that God made for them. They had no rent to pay, they had no taxes, no locks or keys, no vandals, no police, no hospitals, no drug stores. They enjoyed perfect health. They had endless youth. They had undying commitment to each other and they had the boundless love of God. It was God's design that one big, happy, healthy family would in inhabit planet Earth. That was God's original design. God also knew that mankind needed a challenge, employment. We talked about a Sabbath school this morning. If you missed Sabbath school, you missed a really good lesson. And these lessons have been very well put together on education. So man needed a task that he would be responsible for and enjoy the pleasure of accomplishing. Doesn't it feel good when you've accomplished something? You finish a task, a sense of well-being. So what did he do for Adam and Eve? He said, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to what? To tend and keep it. This is yours. Work it. Take care of it. Enjoy it. While the bounty of this new world is God's and his alone, he entrusted mankind with the stewardship of the earth. And Thomas, I think you brought that up during Sabbath school, the earth. We are stewards of the earth, too, not just of money, time, talents. God is the owner of planet earth and everything in it, but we are stewards managing his property. Wow. What a responsibility that God would trust us to do that. And what, what a, an advantage in, in the way he just allows us to grow and learn and manage what he has given us. The Bible says the earth is a Lord in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So what does he own? The earth in its fullness, the world and who are the those that dwell therein? Us, yes, those who dwell in. Again, the Bible says in Psalms 50 verses uh, 10 through 11, for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. It is God who gives us the ability to make money. Did you know that? 
He gives that ability. We really don't own anything. As our creator, God has a claim on our possessions and our lives. God has claims on you above and beyond what you have on yourself. He's the king. He's the creator. He's the ruler. We are his subjects and his people. So God is supreme over all. And because of that, in Deuteronomy 8.18, he says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. So the concise Oxford Dictionary defines a steward as a person entrusted with the management of another's property, a steward. Today, when a person enters into a stewardship relationship, he wants to know what the owner expects of him. Don't you want to know? If you're entering into a relationship, okay, what's my responsibilities? What do you want me to do? How should I act? This is the understanding God had with Adam, for the Bible states, of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God tested man's loyalty and love. Adam and Eve could eat from all the other trees in the garden, but they were not to eat from that one specific tree. By obeying God, they would show their recognition of his ownership, that he was ruler, a test of obedience. If they were faithful stewards and chose to maintain their allegiance to God, they would live forever in a world that was a paradise. However, Adam and Eve failed the one simple test God required of them. They were unfaithful stewards, and they lost everything, the garden home, immortality, love, happiness, security, a clear conscience, and face-to-face -face communion with God. That was probably the biggest loss, that face-to-face -face communion with God. But God had a plan to reverse that. Through Christ's death on the cross, the restoration of planet Earth was made possible. But man lost it, and what's God doing? He's trying to restore it. Everything we are and everything we have has been made possible by Jesus' eternal death in that eternal gift. I'm sorry, I, read that, I said that wrong. Excuse me. By Christ's eternal gift to the human family. Whether we love him or not, our lives and our possessions are his property. He owns it. All the gold is his, all the silver is his, all the jewels are his, all the money is his. And Fort Knox, thank you for taking care of God's gold. He owns it all. So not only is Jesus our creator, he's our redeemer. And just like Adam and Eve, we are stewards of what God has entrusted to us. So what does he require of us? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, the Bible says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that they, that one be found faithful. Faithfulness. One day he's going to say, Enter into my kingdom, thou good and faithful servant. We are stewards of God's gift of life. The greatest of all gifts is life itself. The Apostle Paul declares... Acts chapter 17, God, who made the world and everything in it, gives to all life, breath, and all things. So who sustains, sustains us? God does. He's the one who gives us life. He's the one who gives us breath. He's the one who gives us all things that we have. Every heartbeat, every breath that we take, every pulse of our bodies is a gift of God. So in the morning when you wake up, open your eyes and say, Lord, thank you for another day of life. We are stewards of the time God gives us. We are not only stewards of money, we are also stewards of time. Time is important. 
Someone has said that time is the stuff life is made of. In the Psalms, David requested of God, so teach us to number our days. Time, numbering our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. To waste time is to waste life. To squander that talent which God himself has given to each man and woman. Every person has the same number of hours in a day. The same number of minutes in those hours. And we will be held accountable for the choices made to fill them. While all time belongs to God, he asks that the seventh day Sabbath be devoted to fellowship with him. He invites us to put aside the weekly pressures of work. Let it go and rest. Put away shopping, worldly pursuits, and remember him that he is our creator and redeemer. So every seven days, we are witnessing to this planet that there is a creator, that there is a sustainer, and he is so sovereign over all. So we are a beacon as Seventh-day Adventists in this world to a living and true God, the only true God. Through our time, our Sabbath time, we believe that there is a God. We are also stewards of the talents God gives us. Well, someone may say, I'm not sure I have any talents. Today, we would use the word talent to mean to sing well, play well, paint a picture, sewing, writing, organizing. These are talents, but the talents God had in mind are not limited to just these. As God's stewards, we're responsible for everything he gives us, lifetime, abilities, possessions. God holds us accountable for that, especially for some people who have natural abilities, and they can use them for the blessing of others. God will ask us whether we have used these talents to enrich ourselves and satisfy our whims and pleasures or to bless others. Jesus said, follow me. He lived unselfishly. The Bible says, Jesus who went about doing what? He went about doing good. Everywhere he went, he was just doing good. It was better off after he left than before he arrived. Most of us are content to just go about. Our talents are not to be used to get the praise of men. They are loaned to us to bless others, to be a blessing, helping other people. We are stewards of the money God gives us. One day, Abraham's nephew Lot and his family were taken captive from their homes in Sodom by an enemy tribe. Remember Abraham and Lot, they had big herds and there wasn't enough grass for them. So the herdsmen started fighting and Abraham went to Lot and said, no, we just can't go on this way. You go that way, I'll go this way. You go this way, I'll go that way. So Lot looked and what did he see? He saw Sodom, lush, I'll go that way. Well, sometime later, a war broke out and Lot was taken captive. And when the news reached Abraham, he determined to rescue Lot and all the people. Abraham prayed for God's guidance. He prayed that God would give him success. And God was with him because he reclaimed everything. Lot, his family were rescued. All the treasures that were stolen were brought back. And when Abraham approached Sodom, the king came out and met him, urging him, keep those treasures, keep everything, just return the people. Wow. Kind of a bit of a temptation, isn't it? But Abraham refused to take anything for himself. Mechizedek, the priest of God, brought Abraham a meal and blessed him. And then it says, then Abraham gave Mechizedek a tithe of what? everything. He paid that 10% of everything. Why didn't, so he paid the 10th the and then he didn't take anything else. He gave it back to the people. Why didn't he want to take anything? Because God gave him the victory. He went and saved those people out of the goodness of his heart. He didn't want their money. He didn't need their money. He was thankful for what God had done. He returned the people, returned their money, and he gave a tithe of everything, recognizing 
Thank you, Lord, for coming through. Thank you for having my back and the back of my men. And thank you that we could bring all these captives that would have been slaves and everything that was stolen from the city back, showing appreciation for what God has done. And that's what really this is all about, appreciating what God has done for us. So Abraham expressed that appreciation and acknowledging God's ownership and blessing. 150 years later, Abraham's grandson, Lot, expressed his gratitude to God in the same way. While fleeing his angry brother, Jacob felt utterly alone and afraid. He desperately wanted the protection of God because he felt guilty because he deceived his father and he swindled his brother. Remember the promise before they were born, the two twins in Rebecca's belly? The older shall serve the younger. So sometime as they were growing up, that must have been told them. And Jacob was the younger, thinking, I'm going to get that, that blessing. I'm going to, my brother's going to rule over me. So what did he do? He found a way to swindle it instead of letting God give it to him. So he deceived his father, robbed his brother. He was fearing that God had forsaken him for what he did. It was really, uh, really bad what he did. And he was worried about God forgiving him. And he had a great sense of remorse, of repentance. He confessed his wrong to God. And then wearily he lay down on the ground and slept. And what was his pillow? A rock. I gotta get the softest, cushiest pillow for me to sleep. But he, he could use a rock. And then the story continues. He's wondering, Lord, have you accepted me? Am I forgiven? What I've done was a terrible deed. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. When Jacob awoke, he knew God had been there. God had spoken. God had promised guidance and protection. Deeply touched and grateful for that answered prayer and the vision that he saw. And he said, of all that you give me, I will surely give a what? A tenth to you. So all my prosperity in the future. He didn't have anything right there and then. He was a fugitive. But Lord, everything you do for me, I'll give a tenth to you. King David felt the same way when he asked, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? All the things God does for us. And that's a great question. What can I render back to you? You do so much more for me. Have you ever wondered how to thank God for his incredible goodness to you? For the gift of life, family, for health? The Bible principle of stewardship provides a tangible way of expressing our appreciation to God for all his benefits. A couple of weeks ago, I had that song, count your blessings, name them one by one. If we would really count our blessings and keep things in perspective, we would see, you know what, there's more good in our lives than bad. Now, sometimes things do go bad. We recognize we're living in a planet where things don't always go well. But when we come out of it, we realize, you know what, we've come out of this. We've come out. We've come out. God has, has taken care of us. So we just want to show appreciation for all the benefits God has, has done. The first written instruction regarding tithing or returning a tenth to the Lord is recorded in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. They were an agricultural society. So they would sell their grain or give their grain in the tithe of all the seed and all the fruit. And then it says here, it is what? Holy to the Lord. So it's God's money and a tithe is a holy money. You have holy money to give to a holy God. As we return a tenth of all we earn, we are actually expressing, uh, impressed with the truth that God is the creator and source of every blessing. And how is the tithe to be used? In the book of Numbers, behold, I have given the children of Levi, 
They were the ministers of the tabernacle of God and the services of God. All the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. So that's what the tithe was used for. Throughout the Bible, we find that the tithe always supported the work of God. The Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, going back to the Old Testament? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should what? Live from the gospel. So I'm paid from the tithe. And it's interesting, I get paid from the tithe, and the Bible commands me to pay tithe from the tithe I'm paid for. So why does God want my 10%? To show the same trust and appreciation that you're showing. So I'm right there with you. 10% of my check, first thing, tithes and offerings. And uh, Leslie does the budget. And so we pay our tithes and offerings, just like the rest of you. So it's a blessing. It's a blessing to drop that envelope. When you drop that envelope in the plate back there, it's an act of worship, as much as my sermon, as much as the songs, as much as the prayer, because you're acknowledging to God his ownership and his care and love and the support of his, of his uh, mission and church here on earth. Jesus commended the tithing system at the same time. He rebuked the scribes and Pharisees for their narrow-minded approach to religion. He told him, you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin right down to the last grain as your nine for me, one seed for God. He says, you, you do that. But it, then he says, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done, paying tithe without leaving the others undone, justice, mercy, and faith. So Jesus said, pay tithe, but be what? Be a kind, merciful person. Perhaps you are wondering how you could possibly give a tenth of your income to the Lord. Many people have wondered that. But then somehow they made the decision to trust God's guidance and wisdom and return the tithe to him. Weeks later, these same persons enthusiastically testified that a miracle had happened in their lives. Somehow, nine-tenths of their income went further than ten-tenths ever did, and that's the secret of financial security, is trusting God with our money and our possessions, trusting him. Such Christians have discovered firsthand the blessing promised in Malachi the prophet. Last prophet of the Old Testament, just before Matthew. And he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, so that the Levites can eat and be provided for. And prove me now in this. So bring your tithe into my storehouse, and then prove me in this, in what? Well, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the what? the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessing that you will not, that there will not be room enough to receive it. So God says, prove me. Prove me if I can deliver, if I will meet your needs and bless you. The Lord says the tenth of everything is holy to him. He gives us the, the privilege of returning it to him in order to test our stewardship to see if we will honor and acknowledge his ownership, his blessing, his care for us, his love for us. If we refuse to do that, we are actually robbing God. That's what the Bible says. Can you imagine being a God robber? That's serious. Here's what the Bible says. So Malachi says, but you say to the people of Israel, in what way have we robbed you? So they're saying, how have we robbed God? That was the Malachi's, you're robbing God. How have we robbed God? Well, in tithes and offerings. That's why you robbed God. So while the tenth or the tithe is part of our income, that belongs to God, we are invited to give abundantly even beyond that portion, which is already rightfully God's. 
That's called offerings. Offerings are to be given as God has blessed us. And there's all kinds of opinions on how much offering should be, I'm going to just say, should be abundant. Should be abundant. Offerings help pay for the upkeep and operation of our local church. You like to come in here, lights are on, warm. We have a lady comes in, cleans, toilet paper, water, insurance is paid, upkeep. It takes a lot of money to run a building like this. When running Sabbath school, we have all the books for the Sabbath school and for the uh, adult quarterlies. So there's a lot of things that need to go. So if you like a nice looking church, then be generous in your offerings. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus says, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and what? Running over. That's talking about an abundance. God's plan for financing his work on earth is simple and beautiful. He asks his people to give from their hearts. In the Old Testament, when they were bringing money to build the uh, tabernacle, everyone who had a willing heart, that's what God asked. If you have a willing heart, bring it. He wants you to give it from the heart. And we do that because we're not going to fear about our own needs. They'll be met. God will meet that all our needs. Perhaps you were thinking, if God owns everything, the gold, the silver, cattle, lands, and us, why does he need my money? The tithing system is God's plan for financing his work on the earth. And honestly, you giving tithes is drawing you closer to God. Trusting him. Showing your allegiance. So it's not just funding God's work alone. It's what comes back to you. What comes back to you. When I first started attending the Adventist church, I think about the second week, I saw one of these in the pew. So I pulled it out. I opened it up. Tithe, 10%. Well, I knew what that was. I knew what 10% was because I was 25 at the time. When I was 15 years old, I was sitting at the Thanksgiving table at my mom's house and my sister and her husband had just become Latter-day Saints and they started talking about how they're paying tithe and I heard my brother-in-law maybe two people down from me and I'm looking at him he's saying yeah we're giving 10% to the church I'm saying to myself who in the world would ever give 10% to a church 15 years old 10 years later I'm in the Adventist church and Leo was giving me Bible study. So I went to Leo and I says, Leo, what's this 10% stuff? That's the money you give so other people can learn about Jesus. 37 years paying tithe. That's all I needed to hear because I had found the joy and hope in Jesus. And I wanted other people to find it too. And if I can just give 10% of what I was making so other people can know about Jesus, what a benefit and blessing that is. Matter of fact, when I started giving 10% and getting cleaned up, I was spending less money on my indulgences, so I had more money because I was living now a cleaner life. It's amazing. So I got the little envelope here, and it says 10%. You can fill your name out, 10%. Then some for offering, and there's some other offerings here. Total it up and just drop it in. And when you want to put your name there, you don't have to. But you can get a tax receipt for uh, at the end of the year. So when you get paid, so that's how that's how my tithing started. That was, I couldn't have I couldn't have that must have been a divine answer by Leo because he was a drunk. A drunk was giving me Bible studies, studying with the Adventists. He was studying with the Adventists, and wherever that came, it had to be the Holy Spirit. And it is so true, my brothers and sisters. It's helping others learn about Jesus. It is. So God gave the tithing because he didn't want us to have bingos or lotteries or raffles. So God give, so each person gives according to what he receives. So if someone has $1,000, the tithe would be $100. If someone earns $100, the tithe would be $10. Can anything be fairer? Now back when... Uh, ben Carson was running for president back in the 
2015, and they had, he was part of one of the panel discussions, and Trump was there and others, and they said, what do you think about the tax code? And they came to Ben Carson, know what he said? Anybody know what he said? 10%. I was like, wow, how cool is that? Because it's a completely fair system. Everybody pays 10. If you make a little, you're paying 10 of a little. If you make a lot, 10 of a lot. So it's really a blessing. So not only besides having the tithe envelope here, you can also give online at the RaleighSBA.org website. And on the very right-hand side, it says online giving. Just click that. They'll bring you in. You register. Very simple. And you can pay online if you want. And that's how I pay. Very, uh, it's easy. And it's, and it's laid out like a tithe envelope. So when you get in there, all the columns, and there's actually a second page with more columns uh, on there uh, for other, other types of giving here within the church for different ministries. But perhaps more important than financing God's work, it's the benefit we receive. It helps us not to be self-centered and greedy. What did Jesus say? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So it's really a heart issue. Jesus was very serious about our attitude toward our possessions. For if not surrendered to Jesus, they could lead us away from God. They could become idols. They could result in the loss of life. The rich young ruler, he came to Jesus, kneeled down. What must I do to be saved? Keep the commandments. Well, I've kept them all. What do I lack? Well, go sell all you have and follow me. He was, he was being offered an apostleship. And what did he do? He walked away sad. And in one of the Gospels, it says, because he was rich. His money was a barrier to him and Jesus. Don't let money be a barrier to you and Jesus. Jesus said, what is it? What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. The problem with modern man is that our lives have become so complex, our schedules so busy, that we either forget or we do not take time to remember where all God's blessings come from. We take them for granted. People fail to consider the price that was paid to redeem them from sin. As a result, we neglect to honor God with our time, our talents, our treasures. Each of us needs to be reminded daily that the things that we love and hold dear to our hearts are just borrowed. They're not really ours at all. Jesus only lets us use them to brighten our lives. So remind us, remind us, dear Lord. Everything we have is a gift from God. Amen. Our lives are a gift from God. Our health is a gift from God. Our breath, every breath that we take is a gift from God. The food we eat, the clothes we wear, the houses we live in are gifts from God. Our family, our jobs, everything is a gift from God. When we give back to God, we are saying, thank you, Lord, for what you have given me. And sometimes we don't have much, then we're like Jacob when he was fleeing. He didn't have a, much right there, but he says, Lord, as you prosper me, I'm giving. Because sometimes we have these experiences in our lives. So, and sometimes some of those experiences, later on we thank him for, because it's exactly what we needed to polish us and teach us a lesson. So this morning, would you like to say, Lord, I want to place you first in my finances, and in every area of my life. I, would, I want to be faithful to you out of a heart of love for all the benefits you have given me. I want to show appreciation for your salvation, the forgiveness of sin for your son Jesus, and for all that I have. If you would like to do that, would you raise your hand this morning? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer.